know, we've had a lot of tragedies all over North America and, and in BC we've had a lot of forest fires and how we have <clears throat> been fighting the forest fires. It's been the worst forest fire season on record, so they tell us. <clears throat> At this time of the year, 1950 was the greatest smoke going from BC across Canada. It was called the Great Smoke Pall. It was so bad. It went from BC up to the Northwest Territories through Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario, all the way down to New York State. Some people thought it was actually an atomic explosion because they were so, remember 1950s, we were all thinking about that. And so it was just a tragedy, uh, blocked out the sun. In fact, in Toronto, they put on the, the, the street lights in the middle of the day because it was so dark. And it was a pall, it was just dark, and everybody was running around, it was a foreboding. Much like the portion of scripture we're going to be talking about today, as Gloria mentioned, John chapter 15. It was coming up to the greatest all in, certain, in all of history, this sadness, this, what is happening, what is happening? And although the 11 disciples did not know what was really happening, Jesus knew, and he knew it relentlessly, he was going to be taken as a prisoner, taken to court, taken to the cross, and taken to the grave. He knew that. They didn't yet. And when they found out about it, they were totally brokenhearted. Here are Jesus' last words to his disciples. What are the last things you say when you're going on holidays? You say, now make sure you do this, make sure you do that. One woman, they would be driving down the highway, and she'd say, oh, I think I left the iron on. And so the husband, everybody turn around, drive all the way back. Oh, no, no, it wasn't plugged in. It's okay. This was the regular routine of their holidays. Driving along, then you have to turn around and come back. One day, one holiday, they're driving down. I think, I know, I left the iron on. Husband pulls over to the side of the room, goes into the back, comes back with the iron. <laughs> what would you say the last things to somebody you love? Jesus said, these are the last things I want to tell you before I go out and die. And I want you to hold on to them. I am the true vine. My father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If a man or woman remains in me and in him, uh, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is, not, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given you. This is my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands, and remain in his love. I have told you this, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants it's because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. 
For everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command, love each other. Last words. There are three commands in this portion. One is found in verse 7 and says this, If you remain in me, my words remain in you. Ask whatever you wish. That's the command. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be given to you. Ah, what a bold statement. Let's suppose you gave to your children a hundred dollars to go into Toys R Us. That is before they go into bankruptcy. Toys R Us. Whatever you want, you can buy it. Imagine somebody gives you a thousand dollars to go to Home Depot. Some of you say, where is Home Depot? But some of you know that place. Thousand dollars, whatever you want, you can spend it. What a carte blanche promise. And he says, this is my command. Whatever you want, I'll give it to you. Wow. If my words remain in you. Remain in you. But there's two other commands. One is found in verse 4. Remain in me. That's a command. And the other one is found in verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. Remaining. Remaining. Standing against opposition. Not coming to a certain point and then drifting away. To endure. So endure in your Christian life. That's what he's saying. Endure. Maintain. Stay the course. Don't give up. When you have to do maintenance, I went to the dentist this week. They're okay. They're okay. You have to brush every morning and every night and the flossing and the whole works. Yes. You buy a car, oil and gas and tires and the whole works. It's maintenance. If you have some place like a home, you go outside in the spring and all the things have rotted. You need to take them out. You need to pursue it. And sometimes, and a few times, I must admit, you cover it over with another board. It's beautiful for another year or two. When I was still working at the parts board, my foreman looked at this place at Stanley Park and he said, well, it was rotten. He looked at my partner and he said, well, you're only here for this summer. He said to himself, or he said to me, you're going at the end of the summer to go into school for the pastorate. And he says, I'm retiring next year, so just slap a board on it. <laughs> now you have to understand this man. This man would go to no end of finding rot and taking it out, but he just got fed up with the whole system. But if you want to preserve your house or your car or your tea or anything, you maintain. You remain. You remain. You keep it up. And he's saying, this is what I want you to do. First of all, remain in me. Maintain that relationship with me. And then down in verse 9, remain in my love. Remain in the vine. In verse 7. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish to be given you. Now there is a lot of controversy about this portion. Jesus was just trying to say, listen, you're, you're my believers. You're my people. What I want of you more than anything is to keep on with this message. Take it to the world. But some people say, well, you know, it, what it really means is that if you come to church... Believe in God, you can get lose your salvation if you walk away from God. Huh. We're planning on having an Alpha program in the spring. We're thinking about it. We're moving in that direction. How beautiful. 
And every one of the about seven or eight uh, alpha programs we've had in the past, in every one of them, somebody got saved. So prepare your hearts for bringing your friends, talking to your friends, serving at that, okay? And then we'll finish up at the weekend at Anvil, where we talk about the Holy Spirit and, and just illuminate people about what the Holy Spirit does in our life. The last time we did it and finished up at the at Anvil, we had a whole group. I looked at the picture, I couldn't believe it. it was about 30 or 40 people there that took the course throughout it. Then we went up to Anvil. It was beautiful. We came down, we had, I talked about uh, what the Holy Spirit does for us. We come down, and one of the men that used to go to the church here came up to me and he says, um, You know, you're we talking about eternal security, that when God saved you, you're always saved. I said, Yes. He says, I don't believe it. Oh, I said, that's interesting. Why don't you believe it? Well, that's what I was taught. I said, well, um, be beyond being taught, what verses of scripture do you have? Well, I'll, I'll get back to you. I'm still waiting. I'm still waiting. You see, he was taught something which I totally believe is wrong. You cannot lose everlasting life. And the, the picture that's presented here is Jesus is not saying you're going to lose your salvation. That's not the picture. Please, never think that. Oh, you can never lose eternal life. But what he is saying is the father, the husbandman, comes along and trims off the vines. Whether it's a vine or whether it's a tree, whatever it is, we know the process. And you get rid of the things that aren't doing you any good. That's God working within us. That's God taking care of our life. He says, remain in the vine. What is the vine? The vine is the family. The family. You belong to the family of God. Well, if you belong in a family, you have lots of fruit, lots of evidence of belonging in that family. Some of you know Eleanor went up to uh, our kids' place up in the interior. <clears throat> and Nevea, our great-granddaughter, came and stayed with Eleanor and Rob and Jody for a few days. So Eleanor was taking care of the three youngest, three little girls. And she said, you know, there's a pecking order. I said, really? Yes. The oldest of the three little girls shoved the next girl. And the next girl shoved the youngest girl. That's the pecking order, see? I'm the boss, I can shove you. I'm the next boss, and I can shove you. We all know what family life is like. I was the oldest. And yes, okay, whatever. But perhaps you were one of the younger ones. What are the family traits? What is it gives you away that you're part of that family? I, I like asking people when I when I meet them and whether they serve me or just meet them and says, Where are you from? You can tell they have an accent and they explain it. They're proud of their country. And and what Jesus is saying here, be in the vine, stay in the vine, remain or prove that you're really part of the family of God. Prove it. And that goes with our actions and our talk. And, and as God works on us, he lets things drop off the way. And we don't miss them. In John chapter 12, just before this, Jesus is speaking to the last time to the nation. And uh, he's saying in verse 46, I have come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. Every one of us was born in sin. That's the message of the Bible. That's the message of life. And he's saying, I don't want you to stay there. I want to save you and bring you out of that. That's what Jesus wants to do for us. To be changed as the Father works on our life. And we can see people after years 
And when they follow the Lord, we can see how they develop. It's wonderful. Be changed. That's the union we have. We're united with the Holy God. Isaiah 41 says this. And we sang about it, and I'll refer to the portion in uh, Romans, but this is what God says. The poor and the needy search for water, but there is none. Their tongues are parched with thirst, but I, the Lord, will answer them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will make rivers flow on barren heights and springs within the valleys. I will turn the desert into pools of water and the parched ground into springs. I will put in the desert the cedar, the acacia, the myrtle, the olive. I will set pines in the wasteland, the fir and the cypress together. So that, so that people may see and know, may consider and understand that the hand of the Lord has done this and the Holy One of Israel has created it. It's out of our hands what God has done for us. When he saves us, he picks us out of all the humanity and says, you're my child. You're part of my family. I'm holding on to you and I will never let you go. How beautiful are those words. How wonderful. And God is the farmer. He takes and removes the things of darkness from our life and brings us closer to the light of Jesus. It's a process of life. The castle said this, the meaning of life is to find your gift. The purpose of life is to give it away. God has given to us his family life and he's saying to us, give it away. Look at Judas. We have 11 men in Jesus because Judas had gone out of that place and made an agreement to betray Jesus. He said, I'll do it my own way. I'll force this man to take over in the kingdom. I'm going to be up there with him. And when he realized his sinful, disgraceful act, he threw the pieces of silver back into the temple, then went out. He was full of remorse. And he hung himself. So I'll do it. I'll, I'll get rid of it. I'll get rid of myself. Oh, how could I do such a thing? Jesus said of, of him, it would be better that the man had never been born. Awful. He was filled with remorse. Oh, just a minute. A little while later, Peter has the same feeling. No, I don't know him. No, I, I, really, I promise. I don't know him. Oh, Jesus looked right at him. He went out with remorse. He was so broken hearted. And then Jesus met him after the resurrection and allowed repentance to take over. That's the difference. We can feel sorry for our sins. We can. But what God wants is repentance. And God does that in our life. Allow God to work. The command is to remain. You've reached a certain level of your spiritual life. Don't let it slip away. Continue with it. <clears throat> In his commands, learn of them. Build them into your life. Carry on with what God is doing. So that everybody else will see that you belong to the family of God. Isn't that beautiful? Here's the reason why God brought you into the family. So that the traits that God is working in your life, everybody will see it. Beautiful. Let's close in prayer. No, I was only kidding. we got some more to go here. That's why I see you. Further. Oh, there's more. There's more. It's better. It's better. Really, it is. Verse 14, you are my friends. The family, but now Jesus says, you're my friends. This is something. Well, in the Old Testament, it was Moses and Abraham. They were the friends of God. You're a friend of God. Did you know that? 
And he wants to be your friend. Friend. Hope. What's a friend? Do you have friends? The friendless American male. Because we go to work, we have a great camaraderie with those people, then we come home to our home, and then what happens? Who else do we have as friends? One of the men, uh, years and years ago, at a different church, it doesn't matter, he was saying to one of his bosses at work, he said, uh, I'm going to go home tonight, and we're going to cook supper. We have 50 of the young people coming over to our house. I don't know if he fit 50 people in, but he said, we got 50 people over to our house for supper tonight, and then we have a Bible study. And his boss stand there, just stood there for a minute. And he said, I don't think I know 50 people. How do you know? Who are your friend? What's a friend? What's a friend? You have friends? And know all about you and still love you anyway? <laughs> yes. What's a friend? A friend is just somebody who comes over, right? Knock on the door. I'm here. Or they may just, like some of my friends, just open the door. I'm here. What are you going to do? You gotta... But anyway, that's fine. But what's a friend? A friend is someone you can just sit down and feel comfortable with. Beautiful have friends over years. Beautiful. And sometimes our friends, for one reason or another, us or them, they move away. Maybe 10 or 15 years, you haven't seen them. Hardly talk to them. And yet they come alongside and say, hey, I moved back. And the friendship picks up. Why? Because you're friends. Because there's no heirs. Nothing like that. It's just friends. And, and you work together. You enjoy your presence. You eat together. You have all kinds of companionship. Jesus says, you're my friend. God Almighty wants to be here. Not just in the family. Hey kid, do this, do that. Here's a bunch of rules. No, no, no. Friends puts his arm around. Many of us watched Downton Abbey. And there was an upstairs and there was a downstairs. And there was a lot of friendship. There was tension going back and forth. But there was a lot of friendships. And there was a certain amount of friendship between the people down below and a certain amount of people up on the, uh, on the main floor. But there was a certain line you didn't cross. If you were allowed to go into their company, that was very good. But you didn't take any presumption whatsoever. That's, that's the way a lot of things are. But to be a friend. You keep my commands. Um, Trinity Western University is still in the broil in the midst of them saying to a student, this is a code of morality that you need to uh, sign, a code of conduct. Well, they went through with the teachers, now they're going through with lawyers. And they say, well, you know, this is old, it's new, we're just not going to sign it. What's, what's amazing is, that Trinity Western isn't the only law school in Canada. They can go someplace else, any place else. They won't get as good an education, but you can go someplace else. The other thing that's interesting is, let's suppose you graduated and you're a lawyer, junior lawyer, whatever it is, and you go into a law office. They have some rules, and you better adhere to them. Can't get around them. This is what we do. That's it. You want to go someplace? That's fine, someplace else. But this is what you do. Then what happens? You walk out of the lawyer's office and you go into court and you better believe there's some commands and rules and regulations in the courtroom that you cannot cross over. So we're all stuck with rules. See that man in Alberta just a couple of weeks ago, he went one kilometer over the speed limit and he was given the ticket. Only in Alberta, but we'll leave that for a moment. Anyway, it turned out that they didn't actually uh, get the proper speed, so he was given a discharge, okay. But we all live with laws. Somebody 
came to Jesus one day and said, oh, um, <clears throat> you're a great teacher. What's the greatest commandment? And the greatest commandment is this, love the Lord your God with all your mind and your soul, your spirit and your strength. And the second one is, and love your neighbor as yourself. On these hold all the laws. Love God and love your neighbor. That's it. Beautiful. Neighbors. What are neighbors like? We all have them. I was <clears throat> trying to get my lawnmower going a while ago, pulling away, getting exhausted pulling away. My neighbor across the street, who does know a lot about motors and things, came across, oh, I can't get it going, pulled it a couple of times, we chat. He says, it must be your magneto. So I went in the house, came up with a wrench, and started to take the spark plug off. And he looked at me dumbfounded, and he said, <clears throat> don't you know where your magneto is? I didn't know I had one. <laughs> so he just, with total amazement, <laughs> went across the street, got some tools, came back, we fixed them, and it, it worked. Right now, I get somebody else to cut my grass, I don't have to worry about it. <clears throat> but when your neighbors, you know, he came over to help you, I cannot remember going over there to help him. I do remember that. When they first moved into the neighborhood, Elmer says, here's a box of cookies. Take them a box of cookies. So there was this kind of friendship. But, you know, to be a friend, so our neighbors sometimes are just, hi, goodbye, and just leave them alone. Right? So I, I judge how I love my neighbor by how I'm loving my neighbors. See, there's that, I judge how he treats me, how I will treat him. Did you see this verse here? Did you see this verse? You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you a service because a servant does not know his master's business, but I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my mother or my father I made known to you. Verse up here. Verse 12. There's the killer right there. This is the one. My command is this. Love each other uh, as I ever? No. As I have loved you. We're lifted above this world. It's not how I treat my neighbor. That's not how I love. Back and forth, he gives me $10. I gave him $10 back. That's not we love. We love as God loved us. Which way was that? Right to the cross. Right to give absolutely everything. In fact, he says, you lay down your life for your friends. What do your friends need? Anything. That's what I gave you. That's what I expect you to give to one another. When there's a need, you respond to it. Not because, well, they haven't done it for me. Oh, that language is not part of the Christian repertoire. What we do is, because you have done it to us, we'll do it to others. Friends, verse 11 says, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you, that your joy may be complete. We remain in God's love. We, We've experienced it ourselves, and we pass it on. We nurture it and pass it on. You see, in the family, there's a union there, and that's part of it. But as friends, there's communion there, which we celebrate. And every one of us individually paused our heart to say, Lord, thank you for the loaf. I love you. Thank you for the cup. I love you for what you've done for me. It's more than the family. Family, you can ignore them. You can get, I don't want anything to do with you. And I think we've sometimes gone through that. But then, 
we come to Jesus and learn of his standard for us, oh, love, just love, and love, and love, continuing that thing. Remain in my love. Love each other. How hard is that? How hard is that? Well, sometimes. But then we turn around and say, well, God, this is how you love me. This is how you love the world. But I'm going to pass that on to one another in this particular church. Why is it that sometimes we just get so cold-hearted? C.S. Lewis said this, there have been very few times when somebody has been reasoned out of the faith, stayed at home, and said, well, that's it, I'm done. Although I do remember hearing a story about a man who did just that. It was a small group. And he stood up one Sunday and said, well, you know, I, I've been here for such a long time. I've spoken up here. I've done this and that, and I've been here. I, I'm, I'm done with it now. I, I've done my time, and I'm just going. And so... He got up and walked up, never came back. Sometimes we, we cannot answer all the arguments. Sometimes it gets a hold of it, but not usually. What happens usually is we just drift away. We just drift away. He goes on to say, we don't live our Christian life by feelings. We live our Christian life by feedings that the scriptures are our delight. And we read them, and we put them into practice. How are we doing in that? You see, the rot comes into our life. Uh, do I really need to do that? Can I slap a board on top of it, or do I actually have to tear it all out and do it all right the first again? And chew that over. The first thing to do when I realize that there's a need in my life and come back into a close relationship with God is, first of all, I need to decide that's what I want. Uh, you decide that. Not that person, not that person. This person. Do I want to be closer to my God? Do I want to appreciate the, all the benefits of being in the family? And then do I want to benefit all the friendship of Jesus sliding alongside and sitting down and having communion with him, whether it's here or in a Bible when I open it up and just talk with him, wherever it is, working with a group of people, that kind of presence. So I do what's necessary. I do what's necessary. Tearing rod out, it'll take, it'll take a while. It will take a while. Maybe Christian, saint of God, member of the family, one whom God wants to be your friend. Maybe you're saying, well, I've drifted away so far. Just drifted away. Um, God would say, come back. It'll take you five seconds. God, I want to be closer to you. And you begin again the process of pruning and giving us joy for the, the presence of God in our life. But, here's the hard part. You thought that was hard? Here's the hard part. We begin every morning. It's up to us. 
individually say, God, I want to be closer to you. I want to really be your friend. He hasn't moved. And he brings us close to himself so that we might enjoy the great blessing of Jesus' final words to his disciples that will hold them not only through this horrible, tall, and difficult time, but for the rest of their lives and has passed down to us. Let us continue family life and friendship with our God. Thank you, Jesus. But the intimacy, the relationship, and the delight, first being in your family and secure that way, and then every day being able to lift up our hearts to you and say, God, let's work together and walk together through this day. You know, every one of us, you know, every secret, we pray that you will prune us as we should be pruned to stay close to you and to delight in this friendship, this family that you have died to produce. In your holy name.